thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. Well, after listening to all the talks in these two days, I think there's hardly any need for me to give my talk. Uh, I think, uh, especially my introduction was basically completely given by Philip Zelenko. So I will try to do it uh, a little bit in my own words. Uh, that is, why do we want to do structural biology in C2? Um, I think it's fair to say that traditionally structural biology takes the reductionist approach. Cells are taken apart, the molecular components are fractionated, they are purified or they are made recombinantly, and they are studied one by one by the repertoire of tools structural biology has at its disposal. Now, I think it's also clear that uh, this divide and conquer approach has been tremendously successful if you look at the PDB. But it's also clear that biological functions are hardly ever performed by individual molecules. They are arise from the interactions between the many molecules that in, are inhabiting cells. So it's the interactions that drive cellular functions. So there is <coughs> structural biology aims at studying macromolecular, supramolecular structures in their functional context that is inside unperturbed cellular environments. Now, the method that enables doing that is cryolectron tomography. There's hardly any need to explain that. So in a nutshell, it's the application of tomographic principles of data acquisition, tilting the object in the beam, of tomographic reconstruction resulting in 3D images, um, which combine the power of high resolution 3D imaging with, the, with, I mean, the best possible structural preservation. So the only preparation step is usually um, rapid freezing vitrification. We began to grow cells directly on grids uh, about 25 years ago. These were dictyocelium cells. That was the initial object grown directly on an EM grid. Um, <clears throat> but there was one big problem, and it took a long time to overcome that. That is basically that only the periphery of cells were thin enough to be accessible to tomography. So. <clears throat> uh, that was a very major limitation. There was hope in between that cryosectioning pioneered by Jacques Dubochet's group would be helpful in obtaining uh, in thinning samples. I could hardly ever persuade graduate student or postdoc in the lab to do cryosectioning. Um, <coughs> we, we tried for a while, but we were also frustrated by the fact that it caused very serious artifacts. I mean, vitreous ice is quite compressible. And so the compression can amount to something like 30, 40 percent or so. So we gave up on that and we put our resources, human and financial, into the development of focus ion beam milling. You have heard about that again, so it's usually done in a dual beam instrument <coughs> in which the SM is used to monitor what we are doing and then the focus ion beam ablates the material so we can cut kind of windows into cells. So <coughs> you have seen similar slides today before. We can use very different symmetry, uh, uh, um, um, geometries and, fit and focus ion beam milling. You can cut wedges into the cell. You can cut <coughs> lamella. That is what most people do nowadays. So I think basically by ablating material from above and below the area of interest, <coughs> um, we obtain lamella which are something like 200 nanometers thick, you can go down also to something like a hundred, but then, I mean, the thing becomes a little bit um, unstable and you might lose many of the lamella, which are only supported by the surrounding ice. Now, <coughs> focus ion beam milling has really made uh, cellular structures accessible for tomography, so I will use the first example that is from work that was done by Julia Mahamid a couple of years ago in the lab, so not very recent work. She had grown <coughs> HeLa cells on a grid, and the idea was to look at the nuclear periphery here. So <coughs> what you see on the left-hand side is the nucleus is stained, and then <coughs> at, the, at the bottom right you see a very thin lamella um, in, um, that we looked at then in tomography. Now, if we take a tomogram moving from inside the nucleus to the, to the surface, the first one is here, <coughs> you, you see ah, okay. 
Here you see we are in the region of heterochromatin. You see individual nucleosomes very easily. You can average them. I mean, they are 200 kilodalton, so they are relatively small for subtomogram averaging. But you can get decent averages to a resolution of something like <coughs> 15 angstroms uh, of, of individual of nucleosomes. But the problem is that uh, what is really interested is the connectivity, I mean the part of the, of the DNA, and segmentation for, for that still doesn't work well enough. So there's still a major challenge here on the image processing side. Then we approach, I mean, as we approach the nuclear envelope, there's nuclear lamina, a very fine meshwork of intermediate filaments. And then we, we hit here a nuclear pore complex, first on the nuclear side, here on the cytoplasmic side, and here we are on the surface now of the nuclear envelope where we see polysomes, where we see actin filaments, micro, um, microtubules, etc., etc. Now we can do quite a bit of image processing. It's, uh, th the methods are very well established now for uh, segmentation of filaments. Microtubules are pretty easy, actin is easy, even nuclear lamina. I mean, these filaments are only 3 to 4 nanometers in thickness. You can do pretty good segmentation. What you see on the, oops, on the, on the left-hand side here, this is the nuclear pore complex. That is a structure, not a particularly high-resolution structure of the nuclear pore complex, but it's remarkable in that it was obtained with only a handful of copies of the nuclear pore complex, and that is due to the fact that in this case the data were recorded with the face plate. I mean, the face plate is not very useful for single particle analysis. I mean. It doesn't go to the highest resolution, but it's very useful in tomography because here we are very dependent on contrast. There are many situations in, in, in tomography where there is no possibility for extensive subtomogram averaging, and so the, the contrast in the primary data is very important. So it's also important, I mean, here or you see, <coughs> we would like to, to push that to a level where we obtain a structure like this one here, which is only something like 25, 30 angstroms in, in resolution, <coughs> not with uh, five or six copies, but with just a single one. Then, um, <coughs> well, you can fairly easily, I mean, ribosomes are all this, I mean, uh, the objects that are, you can deal with most easily, they are, I mean, they are large, they have high contrast, about twice the contrast of, um, <coughs> of, a, of a protein, um, and they are very abundant. So, and this is uh, on the surface here, we have these polysomes we have seen in much higher resolution before. So this image puts together in a kind of, as a kind of a synopsis uh, all the, the data I have shown on the previous one. So this is something, this is what we call visualizing the molecular sociology of, um, of a, a volume of the cell. In the next uh, couple of minutes, I will show you a couple of data which we have obtained with an algae, Chlamydomonas, which became quite popular in the lab. It became popular for various reasons. First of all, um, the cytoplasm, but also the nucleoplasm, is a little bit less crowded than in, let's say, a yeast cell or in, in, in a HeLa cell. The second advantage of Chlamydomonas is that basically the topology of organelles in these cells is almost deterministic, so you can predict exactly where you find the endoplasmic reticulum, where you find other features. So what you see here is a slice through an entire Chlamydomonas <coughs> cell, and um, in the next slide we focus on this region here, that is where the, uh, the Golgi apparatus and uh, the endoplasmic reticulum is located. So on the right-hand side here, we have the nuclear envelope, that's the region of nuclear pore complex, the Golgi, and here the endoplasmic reticulum studied with ribosomes. So uh, as you have heard a couple of times today, we can then cut out <coughs> features of interest, in this case, the nuclear pore complex. We have given the data to Martin Beck, who is, has become the expert on nuclear pore complexes, and again with a very limited number of particles here, I think on, on the range of something like 200 particles, got a very decent structure of the nuclear pore complex showing in, in red the main component, the so-called Y-complex. So that is already, it's not yet high resolution, but it's, it's really decent molecular resolution. Now, as I said, uh, without pushing the, 
the, the envelope, I mean, we obtained um, in a very straightforward way, I think we could do much better these days, um, the structure of the ribosome as something like 8.5 angstrom resolution. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, we are not really interested in ribosomes. Our interest is on the opponent of the ribosome, and that is the, the proteasome. Now, <clears throat> the proteasome has about the same size as the ribosome. It's 2.5 megadalton. It's 35, uh, 34 different subunits. It, is, it operates at the uh, executive end of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So proteins destined for destruction, which have to be removed for whatever reason, because they are damaged, because they are no longer needed, are degraded via that pathway. The proteasome itself is a completely non-specific protease. Specificity comes from um, the ubiquitin system, I mean marking cells for degradation. Now, <clears throat> this image I show here, that is more than 10 years ago, that was a resolution of something like um, eight angstroms at the time. It was definitely not good enough to uh, determine basically the position and the architecture in terms of subunit um, structure. Um, so we used at that time, and I will come back to that because I think it will become important, that was also mentioned by Filip Zelenko, I think again to use orthogonal data, and I think that will be important for really mapping, I mean, the cytoplasm in the future. So what we did here was we used, um, in a collaboration with Rudy <laughs> Eberfeld and Andre Charlie, cross-linking and mass spec and the proximity information or the distance restraints that came from those experiments allowed us <coughs> to interpret the density in terms of the molecular architecture. And I think um, it was very gratifying to see that I think it was absolutely correct. I think it has been confirmed later by high resolution structures. Now, before I go back into proteasomes in situ, I need to, <coughs> to say a few words about the basic architecture, I need to introduce it. So this is not in situ data, obviously. This is um, data from single particle analysis. I think I better go back for a moment. So we have the core complex. That is where proteolysis takes place. It takes place in the cavity in the middle of the core particle where the, the active sites are, which are sitting on the beta subunits are located. So any substrate to be degraded has to be translocated into the center, into this cavity here in the core complex. Now, to achieve that, um, the core com particle has to um, associate with the regulatory particle. Its function is to recognize ubiquitinated <coughs> proteins, to deubiquitinate them, that's a prerequisite for, um, for unfolding them, and then to assist in the translocation into the core complex. Now, <coughs> At the core of this regulatory particle, and that is the structure in blue, is an ATPase, which basically drives the unfolding and, and the translocation into the core complex. So uh, I, there isn't time to go into the details of the structure. I just want to make the point that as they go through the functional cycle from the ground state to the binding of substrate and then to the step of translocation of substrate into the core complex, we have fairly large conformational changes. There are <coughs> rotations of whole, I mean groups of subunits, which serve to, to bring the substrate to the mouth of the AAA ATPase and also to the position for the ubiquitylase to remove ubiquitin. Uh, there is a lateral shift which serves to align the unfolding channel in the ATPase with the gate that controls access to the core complex. Now, fortunately, these conformational changes are on a scale or of a magnitude that can be detected and seen already at relatively low resolution. So even at a resolution of something like 20 angstroms, we can tell from the conformation of the particle at which stage it is of the, of, um, the functional cycle. So returning now to the in situ situation, in our Chlamydomona cell, where are the 26S proteasomes located? You see them basically in green here. You see they are lining the inner, <coughs> the, the inner membrane of the nuclear envelope. And there are two interesting spots here. 
which are coincide roughly with the location of the endoplasmic reticulum. So we had that information and we could target these regions relatively easily. Now, <coughs> these are some of the, the raw data. You see on the left hand side with yellow arrows fairly easily, even in the raw data, the basic architecture of the 26S complex. We can of course extract them, do the subtomogram averaging and obtain, in this case, um, a fairly low resolution structure. Now, <coughs> but there also, and that was something that was not clear, I mean, not all particles have two regulatory particles, some have only one. So we can pick all these uh, proteasomes and we can do a classification, we can distinguish between different states of assembly, so they have one or two regulatory particles, we can infer from the conformation whether they are in the ground state or whether they are processing substrate and we can also look what are the interaction partners to what do they bind. Some of three are not interacting with anything we can um, see in the tomograms whether they are <coughs> um, interacting with the nuclear basket or whether they are membrane tethered and we can very nicely quantify that say showing for instance that um, most of the particles are double capped um, that um, that under these conditions, on the conditions of the experiment, 60% are basically in the ground state, sitting there and waiting for substrate. Now, we can map them back now to the tomogram. And on the left-hand side, we are inside the nucleus. On the right-hand side, we are in the cytosol. You recognize the mitochondrion. You see the nuclear pore complexes. <laughs> now, in light blue, you see the positions of all 26S in the nucleus. Some of them in the vicinity of nuclear pore complexes. Actually, most of them, I mean, we can distinguish between the different um, <coughs> um, states in the, in, the, in the functional cycle. Now, we can do a somewhat deeper analysis here and look at all those which are in the vicinity of nuclear pore complexes. And we have very clearly two subpopulations. One population in red is attached or is very close to the membrane, but is located, I mean, at the periphery of the nuclear pore complex. The other population, the yellow one, um, is, at, I mean, at a, at a height well above the nuclear pore complex, but that is the region where the very flexible uh, nuclear basket is located, but they are closer than to the eightfold symmetry axis of the nuclear pore complex. And on the right hand side you see for individual nuclear pore complexes mapping back where they are located. So we have these two populations. They are probably functionally quite different. I think the, the ones sitting on the nuclear basket, we, um, we expect that they are involved in the surveillance of import-export. Those attached to the membrane are probably involved in maintaining the different protein composition of the outer and inner membrane of the nuclear envelope. Now, uh, another story, I told you, there is, I mean, all this, um, a kind of a, of a spot in, in the fluorescent images in the region of the <coughs> endoplasmic reticulum. And that has to do with the so-called ER-associated degra degradation or ERA. So, in a nutshell, Proteins are synthesized um, by ribosomes sitting on the ER. They are translocated into the ER where they are supposed to fold properly with the assistance of chaperones. But that can go wrong, especially under stress conditions and then we have protein aggregation of unfolded proteins. That triggers the so-called unfolded protein response. Now inside the ER there is no powerful degradation system. So in order to remove these aggregated proteins, they have to be greater translocated into the, <coughs> into the cytosol, where they can then be degraded by the 26S proteasome. The system is extremely well studied. There are hundreds of publications on the biochemistry of, of ERAT. But how the protein, well, the rate of translocation, how this if this is organized, that uh, on a molecular level was completely unknown. I should say that these micro compartments near ERAT are highly dynamic, so if you look at them in a time-resolved manner, you see 
they are assembled in oval, they can fuse, so I think they are liquid-like compartments, I mean, coming from liquid-liquid um, phase separation. Now, <coughs> we can fairly easily target those areas, and the, the, the reason why we can target them very easily is because they are devoid of ribosomes, and the ribosomes are so easily visible. And you see here, basically, well, the ribosomes are all obviously in blue, the dark blue ones are those sitting on the ER, and there are patches then on the ER in red, and these patches contain the proteasomes. So we can zoom in on those, and we can do a molecule by molecule analysis. We did not use template matching here. We simply picked the particles in those clusters and, um, and classified them, so we had um, distinct um, classes to which we could apply uh, subtomogram averaging then. So we can again map back the two components we find. The two components are the 26S proteasome and CDC48, the AAA ATPS, which is <coughs> believed to be uh, involved in the retrotranslocation of the um, misfolded or um, uh, of the retrotranslocated protein. Now to it was a bit surprising that CDC48 did not show up where we expected it, basically next to the membrane. Instead, many of the <coughs> um, 26 s proteasomes were directly um, interacting with the endoplasmic reticulum. So that is a cluster. You see, I think, basically, th there are no ribosomes, I mean, intruding into that cluster here. Um, we can do, do a somewhat deeper analysis here once again. We can look into the assembly states, we can look into functional states. I mean, again, in green, the ground state, in, um, yeah, in, in this um, pinkish color, I mean, the substrate processing one. Now, we could look at, I mean, um, we could look into the, the ratio of ground state and substrate processing states depending on the distance from the membrane and what we see here is basically that <coughs> those directly or next to the membrane I think 50% of them were substrate processing as you get further away from the membrane in the cluster <coughs> it's mostly uh, in the ground state if you take those which are within something like 20-25 um, nanometers from the membrane and average them, you always see I mean, some additional mass that is not accounted for <coughs> by the proteasome itself, so tentatively this is substrate that is being extracted from the ER, but there's a lot of heterogeneity because I mean the substrate is not just a single molecular species. So <coughs> that is basically a schematic, I mean how we see um, the ERAT cluster, <coughs> we think and there was some literature from the biochemistry that 26S itself can be involved in extracting <coughs> proteins from the ER, work from Stefan Jensch and, and others, but um, the prevailing view in the field was that it's all this CDC48 that does the retro translocation and then hands over the substrate to the 26S proteasome. We think there are probably two mechanisms, one we call direct and one indirect error. Now, <coughs> this is something very new that is ongoing work. Um, we are doing with yeast cells. Um, <coughs> yeast, when it transitions from, I mean, active growth to a quescent state, um, <coughs> it forms what is called proteasome storage granules. They are, again, little droplets containing um, um, or accumulating proteasomes. Now the idea in the field was basically the following that, I mean, in order <coughs> when the cell goes into quiescence upon starvation, shuts down everything, also proteolysis should be shut down. And um, now the idea was basically that in these droplets or storage granules, um, the, the complex dis dissociates into core complex and regulatory particles, so keeping the whole thing inactive. But that is not what we observed in tomography. 
In fact, in, in yeast, a lot of the proteolysis takes place in the nucleus. And if you look into the nucleus, <coughs> um, at the beginning, at the onset of quiescence, what you observe is the formation of trimers of 26 S proteasomes here. Now, these trimers then are exported, and we can directly visualize that through the nuclear pore complex, and they go into the proteome storage, proteasome storage granules. Now, these proteasome storage granules are initially in a completely liquid state, but then they begin after three or four days to solidify. And what you observe is basically that the, the trimers assemble into fibrils, and these fibrils associate further forming um, paracrystals inside the... Um, the irony is that there have been hundreds of many years trying to crystallize 26 s proteasomes with en without any... Um, um, without any um, result. But here I think we see at least the beginning of, of crystallization in vivo. I think, um, yeah. I think in the last part of my talk, I will tell you one story about a major project between um, some departments in, in, in our institute, in Martin Street. So this is um, funded by an ERC synergy grant, Toxic Protein Aggregation in Neurodegeneration, or TOPAC. My colleague Ulrich Hartl, who is working on protein folding and chaperones, wants to know how the aggregates affect proteostasis networks can we boost the cellular defense against aggregation? My colleague Matthias Mann, who is a, a proteomics expert, what is the composition of the aggregates? How does cellular <coughs> proteome change in response to toxic aggregation? And our interest is, what is the in situ structure of the aggregates? How do they interact with the cellular environment? We first did this with hunting team, but I think I skipped that story. Hunting team basically forms the fibrils. The fibrils interact completely destructively with the endoplasmic reticulum. Whenever a fibril touches upon the endoplasmic reticulum, it changes the curvature of the membrane dramatically, destabilizing the membrane and then <coughs> uh, rupturing the membrane, and then ribosomes are released, etc., etc. But I will talk only about another system because um, to, um, to keep in the, in the, in the proteasome field a bit. That is, um, I mean, the system that is responsible for ALS. The hallmark of that system is basically a hexanucleotide expansion in, in this gene here that results um, in, in, in the synthesis or in the production of toxic e peptide repeats. What is found in the brains of patients suffering from <coughs> ALS is basically alanine glycine repeats. So we had a model system recapitulating that. Um, now here the workflow is um, quite a bit com more complicated than with chlamydomonas. The reason is simply that a neuron is a very large landscape compared with field of view or the tomogram. Everything starts with vitrification, so we grow the neurons on, on widths, vitrify them. Then we use uh, Royce's microscopy to identify cells that contain the include uh, the the toxic aggregate, and um, then we can target them precisely in the focused ion beam. To see basically the experiment, so A is the grid with the neurons, and B, we identify the neurons that have include the toxic aggregate. C, we can target it very precisely for focused ion beam milling. D is the lamella, and we can confirm that the lamella contains the aggregate material, and we take the tomogram. Now, that is a bit strange. Now the movie moves, okay. So, and it looks at the first glance like we have fibrils here, but these are not really fibrils. These are polymorphic ribbons, often bifurcated ribbons. We see very unlike the situation in Huntington, dramatically different, that in between these aggregate material we have many particles. Now we can do the same game as we have done before with ERA. Um, yes, is we pick all the densities, we do a classification <coughs> and uh, generate subtomogram averages. 
and um, basically, so the aggregate material you see is in red here. Proteasomes are in green. Ribosomes are excluded from the aggregate material, and so is the chaperonin that works downstream of um, the ribosome. So basically, what you see here is that we have a massive accumulation of proteasomes inside the aggregate material. Uh, the concentration well, increases something like 40-fold over the concentration in the remainder of the cell here. <coughs> and then we can, of course, because here in this case we have many particles and abundance is, I mean, a key to obtaining high resolution. Um, we can obtain really good resolution, again, uh, in, the, in the 10 angstrom range here. <coughs> Green is the ground state. Blue is the substrate processing state. And what you see in the substrate processing state, we have some mass here that is not accounted for by the mass of the proteasome itself. Now, so the idea is maybe this is substrate and we can show that directly. We can map all the blue guys back to the tomogram. And indeed, they are in direct contact with the aggregate material. So, <coughs> um, yeah, I think I will finish here with, with the data. Just a few remarks. That slide you have seen before. Now, to answer that question, I think in order to realize the full potential of tomography, I think uh, many technical advances will be necessary. Currently, the throughput is fairly low, um, especially focus ion beam milling is a bottleneck, takes far too long. I think that will change dramatically um, shortly with moving from gallium fibbing to plasma fibbing. The lift-out technology I have not talked about that allows to target cells deep in tissue or in multicellular organisms um, is a delicate technique and um, needs also to be improved. I think it's, um, what, what is needed is to integrate basically a cryofluorescence microscope into an ion beam instrument. Again, there are three or four projects around the world doing this. Um, <coughs> in order to, to target things, to, to simplify the workflow, to avoid contamination and these things. Um, I think we should aim for narrowing down the resolution gap between cryo-EM and, and um, cryo-light microscopy, fluorescence microscopy, bring it down to a resolution of, let's say, in the 10 nanometer range so that we can really superimpose and map the fluorescence signal directly on the tomogram. Uh, combining the power of identification with high resolution imaging. I think um, still a factor that, uh, that has a role or that limits resolution is the specimen motion. We have to deal with that either experimentally or computationally. I think, again, uh, the direct detectors cam de detection cameras are not yet at their limit, but again, there are, I mean, there's work going on to, for the next gen generation, improving them further. I think we need improved methods for mining the rich information of tomograms using deep learning, template-free methods for particle detection, etc. And um, last but not least, the integration of complementary of orthogonal information, I think. The idea is that we can map the large complexes fairly easily, but then the small ones, I mean, that will take quite a while and quite some improvement that will be needed. But if we have, again, proximity information coming from in situ or in vivo cross-linking mass spec, I think we can model the environment of, of these anchor proteins. And finally, thank my, um, my collaborators, uh, some of, some, a few of them present, most of them uh, collaborators in the past. And I thank you for your attention. <coughs>